very pleased uh, today to be able to welcome um, Professor Simon Lucas um, from uh, Queen Mary University at London to present our application keynote. Uh, Simon is a professor of AI and also the head of um, the School of Engineering and Computer Science at Queen Mary. But more germane for today's talk, Simon is the head of the university's Game AI Research Group uh, and uh, also founding editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions on Games. Uh, and he's going to uh, talk to us today about general game AI with statistical forward planning algorithms, uh, which we're certainly looking forward to. So um, without further ado, ado, over to you, Simon. Uh, th thanks very much for inviting me and uh, thanks for the intro. So I'm just gonna share my screen we did test this a moment ago, so hopefully it still works. Uh, let me just get rid of that Zoom window. And move that bar around, just bear with me a second. Uh, okay, so you should be able to, to see my screen with the title slide. Yeah. We can, yes. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, yeah, so as I say, thanks for inviting me to to give this talk. It's a real pleasure to uh, be here. <laughs> well, virtually, I think it'd be even more pleasure if we could be together in, uh, I think it was normally in Peterhouse College in Cambridge uh, and maybe having a, a rather nice dinner afterwards. Uh, right, so th that, that said, um, I'll crack on with the talk. So um, I, I just want to give a brief uh, couple of uh, plugs. So as was mentioned, I'm director of the Game AI Research Group at Queen Mary. Uh, we set this up when I moved to Queen Mary three years ago, and we're now 10 academic staff, more than 25 PhDs, PhD students and postdocs. Uh, we've got really strong links with the games and the tech industries, and uh, we do cutting edge game AI and also have some fun game nights. Uh, so a couple of things on the slide on the background is and in this image here, uh, this is a visualization of um, uh, random rollouts. Uh, this is particular one is to play noughts and crosses, obviously a rather trivial game, uh, but it just illustrates um, some of what we do in the group, which is to use uh, random rollouts, uh, Monte Carlo search, Monte Carlo tree search, rolling horizon evolution and uh, a variety of statistical forward planning algorithms to uh, realize uh, general AI across a range of games. And some of the games that we do are pictured here. Uh, so on the top left is Planet Wars, uh, bottom left is uh, Pandemic within our tabletop games framework. Uh, the bottom right is uh, Tribes, which is a, a version of um, Polytopia. So the sort of things we do, uh, a lot of um, statistical forward planning, a uh, bit of deep RL. We use AI and tools for automated game design and content creation. Uh, we also aim to create human-like player models and uh, increasingly use game AI for, for real-world applications. Uh, just th this is my um, last uh, sort of shameless plug talk. I just want to advertise uh, IGI, which stands for Intelligent Games and Game Intelligence. Uh, so this is in its second um, a five year round of funding now, so 10 years of funding in total. Uh, so over those 10 years, we're funding at least 120 PhD places in uh, uh, games and game AI research. And currently this is joint between the University of York and Queen Mary. Uh, so more of the details here, and there's a QR code. So please forward this to anyone who you think might be interested in applying for a PhD. Uh, we've got a great program and the deadline for September entry is January the 31st. Uh, okay, so on with the, the talk. Uh, so game AI has really uh, started to uh, mature, I think, in the, in the last uh, decade, maybe. Uh, so what we see in this, in this slide is in the top, uh, so on the left-hand side, uh, there's Deep Blue versus Kasparov. Um, this was a, a success for uh, tree search and heuristic functions. So this um, was a... Uh, really, really big success for IBM uh, with Deep Blue beat uh, Gary Kasparov. That was back in 1997. And it's reckoned that um, although in IBM invested a lot of money in, in doing this, uh, they really uh, reaped enormous rewards in terms of the publicity. So success in games can be uh, very good in terms of publicity, but perhaps more importantly, in terms of um, 
really driving forward the state of AI research. And games are also a fantastic application area of AI. So by developing better AI, we, we can make better games. And I mentioned on one of the previous slides that uh, within our group, we're, we're really interested in uh, developing uh, better, better games and using AI to test those games and also develop content for those games. And again, having AI to, to play test the games. And for this sort of thing, we need um, AI that can learn very quickly. But um, just to uh, give a flavor of some of the big results that you've probably heard of um, for uh, reinforcement learning lately, uh, on the top right is, is at, uh, Go, and of course, uh, DeepMind developed uh, AlphaGo and then AlphaZero, so amazing results on Go. And then AlphaStar, and then in the bottom right is uh, OpenAI 5 in the Dota 2, which is a team game. Uh, all very, very impressive results. Uh, so, however, many of these impressive deep RL results, they tend to come at uh, significant computation and engineering cost. Uh, so they're often, uh, the neural networks can be slow to train, they have limited generalization. And for many of these results, uh, they've got large teams of really sort of uh, top-notch uh, engineering and scientific expertise behind them. Uh, so the one of the takeaways, I think, is that although the results are you know, fantastically impressive, uh, they, they come with significant cost. And I think uh, my, my position on this is that for some cases, we can actually do better uh, by exploiting statistical forward planning methods. And in this talk, I'll, I'll go into some detail by what we mean, uh, about what we mean by these methods. Uh, just to um, mention again one of the limitations of uh, some of the deep RL results. So there's been a lot of uh, work on the Atari learning environment, which takes uh, classic uh, Atari 2600 games. So these were console games from the uh, late 1970s slash early 80s, and uh, uses uh, typically reinforcement learning to learn to play them. And in the early days of this, back in 2015, this, this was considered quite tough. Uh, it's now considered maybe uh, a little bit um, easy because the state of the art in the research has progressed significantly, uh, but also the games are largely deterministic. And so with many of the results, we have to question them because they've kind of overfit to the very uh, kind of precise details of the particular environment. And if you change the environment a bit, quite often the, the learned policy of the network, it just collapses and, and plays really badly. And there was a really nice paper that in exploring this effect in significant depth from OpenAI and some of the games uh, pictured on the right. And the idea is that uh, they took the, the same sort of game, like a platformer game or a Pac-Man type game, uh, but used procedural generation methods to generate many, many versions of it. And then explored how well the uh, game is trained on, the, the agent trained on particular instances of the game, then generalized to uh, different instances of the same game. And you can see the results pictured here. Uh, so in each case, the, the blue line is the performance on the games that it's been trained on. And the brown line is the performance on games that it's not seen. So game instances that it's not seen. And what you can see is in many, many cases, there's a, an absolutely wide gulf between the games it's been trained on and the test games, so the ones it hasn't seen yet, uh, showing that it's really, um, it's not kind of learned the underlying nature of the game, it's just learned to play exactly those sort of instances of the game. Uh, and that's a, that's a real sort of problem if we want to have uh, AI that's going to cope with a, a, a sort of wide range of uh, different circumstances. So this uh, still means there's a ma major challenge to be met here. Uh, so some breakthroughs in, in game AI. Uh, deep reinforcement learning then is, um, is on the whole, uh, slow to learn, I would say. So it takes significant uh, computational resource and typically um, maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of uh, game plays to, to learn to play. Uh, but once you've learned a policy, the network is very fast to, to apply. So it's very, very efficient when it uh, runs. So for SFP methods, uh, which you can also think of being as kind of simulation-based AI, what we get is very rapid learning, 
uh, but it does need a forward model. And I'll say more about this as we go through the talk. And probably the most uh, famous examples of this, um, Monte Carlo tree search and uh, perhaps uh, rolling horizon evolution. So uh, the image on the right has got a particular fondness for me because uh, I've reused something from a talk I gave and uh, a competition I entered actually, uh, I think related to this, uh, to a previous version of uh, a meeting run by this group, the, the SGAI. Uh, and this was um, our entry, uh, rapidly adapted game agents, uh, which won the 2012 BCS uh, prize for progress towards uh, machine intelligence. And I know that was organized by, by Max. Uh, so thank you, Max, for organizing that. And we were delighted to have won it. Uh, so what we were using for our agents at the time were Monte Carlo Tree Search. And that's pictured in this image here. Uh, this is a, a kind of a to toy game where you just simply get uh, more reward the more you move to the right. And this is showing how MCTS uh, exploits this and it builds the, the tree more towards the, the right moves than the left moves. And uh, the, the counts here shows the number of victories and the number of times each node was explored. So what MCTS enables us to do is overcome limitations of um, traditional uh, kind of classic minimax search algorithms, which used uh, the, which built game trees in uh, much more sort of exhaustive ways and uh, didn't scale to, to problems that were more complicated. Uh, so that, that, that was, uh, MCTS was a fairly major breakthrough. Uh, so a question that I often like to, to pose is, um, is statistical forward planning the, the next deep learning? Uh, and by this, I mean, can it have a similar impact on AI and uh, do it in a, in a nice sort of explainable way? And that remains to be seen, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's got huge, huge potential that um, you know, like only sort of 1% explored so far. So the concept is illustrated uh, here and I'm gonna run some live demos uh, in, a, in a minute, but, uh, and I also apologies if anyone knows the idea already, I'm gonna kind of label the point a bit, but I find when I give these talks before quite often, uh, it, it takes a while to get the, the idea fully embedded. So the, the idea is quite simple. So we're gonna take copies of the current simulated world state or model, and we're gonna optimize a sequence of actions and we're gonna choose an action that's likely to lead to a good, uh, good outcome. And we're gonna repeat this process for every decision that we have to make in the in the game or in the planning problem. So we're going to see more of uh, images like this. So I'll, I'll just talk you through what, what this means. So each one of these different colored lines here corresponds to a different sequence of actions. And each action sequence is, uh, in this case, 100 steps long. And then on some of the games, what we're able to do is to plot the expected position of the avatar uh, as it um, goes forward in time. It's a tra tra trajectory given each of the action sequences. And what I keep meaning to do, but haven't done yet is actually, uh, th th these should be the, in the same sort of color as the ones down here. Uh, but the thicker lines are the more heavily explored ones. So what this has shown is that the agent can um, uh, look in a, a sort of future expected reward, which is the, the top one, uh, and in the actual game itself. So this is a game called Cave Swing that I wrote, which I'll, uh, uh, show you a demo of in a minute. But the idea is simple. So uh, 100 steps in the future, uh, you can see this line uh, doesn't do so well because more reward is better. So we want to be further up the graph. And so it's going to choose maybe this line and it's just going to take the first action here. And then it's going to repeat the whole process at the next step. So all the time we just simulate impossible futures and um, we, we want to choose the future that's going to be most favorable to us. Uh, now, if you want to apply these, these methods, you do need a model of the system. So we call this a forward model. And if you're implementing a game from scratch, this is, uh, or a planning problem from scratch, this is quite straightforward to do. Uh, so you've got your, your model of the world, your game state or world state, and it just has to implement this interface. And the key ones here, which can be a bit difficult to do if you don't think about them carefully enough, are to take a copy of the game state and to take a current set of actions, so from all the players involved, and advance to the, the next uh, state of the game. Uh, so 
just some points on these these SFP approaches. So there's a whole family of algorithms. So I've mentioned Monte Carlo tree search. I've mentioned rolling horizon evolution, but it's it's anything where you're uh, simulating possible action sequences and looking at the statistics of the outcomes and then making informed choices about what to do based on those simulations. Uh, so we think this gives a, a nice sort of explainable form of AI because to understand why a decision has been made, you can look at the simulated outcomes and you say, well, okay, yeah, I've done this because I expect to earn so much more money if I take this sort of course of action. Uh, the AI is, uh, is very tunable. And so you, you can make uh, very direct changes to how it uh, operates and observe those changes taking place uh, immediately. And you might have to do it in a way that's different for each game, but it has the same sort of effect. Uh, so in that previous example, uh, we're doing rollouts of a length of 100. So our action sequences are 100 steps long. Uh, but we can we can tune this. So sometimes we want agents which are not too uh, not too clever, or maybe um, are quite short sighted. And so human players can learn to outwit them uh, by by being more far sighted. So we can tune this with the sequence length. Uh, then we have the number of evaluations, which is the going back to this. That's the the number of lines on this graph here. And by making this. Uh, by making more evaluations, it leads to a more uh, thorough thinking sort of agent that um, uh, doesn't sort of miss obvious things, I would say. And then we can tune the, uh, the shift buffer or the tree reuse. So once we made an action, uh, we can either uh, throw everything that we've just um, modeled and just start from scratch for every decision point in the game, or we can, we can keep what we've already uh, learned uh, just throw away the first action, shift everything forward, and then start the process with that sort of seeding point. Uh, so that we call uh, using a shift buffer for rolling horizon or reusing the tree in the case of Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, so these um, you know, different algorithms also have different intrinsic behaviors in different games. And so we can choose the actual algorithm to, to meet the uh, precise requirements that we have. So there's a family of algorithms and each of them can be tuned to uh, get the, the, the sort of type of behavior, broadly speaking, that we're aiming for. And the fact that they can just be tuned with these parameters so simply, I think is, is quite a plus point. Uh, so I'm, I'm not um, claiming for a minute that SFP is new, it's, it's certainly not. Uh, the first that I know of it is, I think in um, 1998, when uh, uh, Brian Shepard uh, published or de developed a, a Scrabble playing program called Maven, uh, that I think won the, the World Championship in Scrabble. And then Monte Carlo Tree Search revolutionized Computer Go in 2006. Uh, within our group, we developed Rolling Horizon Evolution, which is very good for video games. And uh, that was done in 2013. And recent uh, developments, I think, have uh, led to significant advances in performance. So um, because I'm talking about rolling horizon evolution, I, I just want to give some insights into evolution. So uh, maybe in the, in, in the whole of AI, I think evolution, or simulated evolution, is one of my favorite algorithms or favorite approaches. Uh, so what I love about it is that it's just so incredibly simple. So what we do is start with a randomly generated solutions, uh, evaluate them, that just means check how good they are. And then we're gonna generate new ones by mutating the best ones and we'll simply replace the worst with the new ones. And it's uh, obviously, it's a field of research that's uh, decades old and there are many, many uh, different approaches within it, many sort of subtleties, so much research being done, but actually, one of the things that I like best about it is that um, even the very simplest versions of the algorithm perform remarkably well across a wide range of problems. And I think that's wonderful. Uh, so I want to give some insight into why evolution may work even in very large search spaces. And also to point out that um, some of what goes on in the research in this area I think is um, 
is maybe over concerned. Maybe, maybe that's not fair, but it, let, let, let's say it's very concerned with sort of solving toy problems extremely well. When I think we could do more on solving hard problems well enough. So let, let me explain what I mean by that. And also why evolution may work in even in very large search spaces. So we've got an image here. This is a 200 by 200 binary image. Uh, so each pixel is either black or white. And there are 40,000 pixels. So, uh, you know, you, you all know uh, how many possible images are there of this type? Uh, well, of course, the answer is um, two to the 40,000. So the dimensionality of the search space is 40,000, 40,000 dimensions. Uh, each one has two values. So there are two to the 40,000 possible images. So, um, how quickly can you recognize this image? Let's play this. I can recognize it very quickly because I've seen it before and it's also very familiar to me. Uh, so this is a Queen Mary logo and you can see it kind of emerge from all the, the random noise. Now, the key things about this is that um, you'll have noticed that if you, if you you know, you, you might have not have recognized it as a Queen Mary logo, but you probably would have recognized it as a crown. And it was recognizable after just a few thousand iterations, even when there was lots and lots of noise. Now, in many real world planning problems or decision making problems, there are so many uncertainties that it's kind of pointless to imagine we can aim to be optimal. Uh, often we're just looking for good solutions. And this is uh, true also in complex games where there may be lots of hidden information. You don't know what the opponent's going to do and what you're aiming for really is a, a good solution rather than the perfect one. So if we, if we look at the evolutionary trace that, that just happened, as we're seeking towards a more and more perfect solution, we start off with randomness. And in the first part of the search, we're on this really kind of steep incline here where mutations to the current best solution, they're very likely to be favorable. I mean, to begin with, we've got, we might even have a 50% chance of uh, getting lucky with each mutation. As we get closer to the optimal, it becomes very, very hard for a mutation to be beneficial. It's much more likely that it's going to take us further away. And so it kind of asymptotically approaches perfection. But like I said, for real world problems, this is uh, going to be an ill-defined concept. And so it may not matter. So the observation is that providing we don't aim to be optimal, we may find good enough solutions quickly. So quickly is important in really large search spaces. And this is what enables these algorithms to work in practice uh, for, for these sort of planning problems. Uh, so just to give you a concrete example, so rolling horizon evolution uh, in, in practice, uh, this is uh, playing an arcade game where I can thrust, turn left, fire, turn right and so on. Uh, the first sequence at the top, that's been simulated. Let's imagine it's 100 steps long. I've just shown the first few. And that leads to an increase in score of 250 points from the beginning to the end of the sequence. Uh, we now mutate that turn left into a turn right. And that leads to an increase in score of 350 points. So we're going to accept the mutation as our current best solution. And uh, this actually leads on to my uh, favorite uh, SFP algorithm. So the, the simplest form of rolling horizon evolution, and there are many more complex ones, and sometimes we need them to be more complex. Uh, but this is the first one to try on a new problem because it's so simple. Uh, so the best sequence here, we start off with a random integer sequence of length n. This is the, um, the, the planning horizon. Then for each decision in the game, uh, we're going to take the shift and random append of the best sequence so far. And then we'll iterate this for a number of evaluations. We'll say the mutated sequence is a mutation of the best yet. And then if the score of running the forward model on the mutated sequence is better than or equal to, it should be the score of the best sequence so far, then the best sequence becomes a mutated sequence. And then at the end of that, we return the best sequence. It's a really, really simple algorithm. And it works amazingly well across a range of problems. Uh, okay, so I'm going to... Um, show a couple of uh, demos now of this in practice. Uh, so I'm just, I'm sharing my whole screen. So I think you should be able to see this. Um, please somebody uh, give us a shout if you can't. 
so these are some of the parameters. Uh, so sequence length, I'm going to start uh, playing asteroids now. Well, the AI is going to play asteroids, but with a short sequence length of 10. So what you're going to see now is uh, these the, the pink lines where this is a sort of planning horizon of the, the ship. They're quite short and it's, you know, it's doing some good things, but it keeps, uh, it keeps crashing into things and that's game over. So now what I'm going to do is run the, the same type of experiment, uh, but now with a planning horizon of length 100. So now you can see these uh, pink lines have got much longer and the agent should should play more skillfully. These are statistical algorithms. There's lots of randomness. The, the game is non-deterministic. Actually, it's a largely deterministic game, this particular one. Uh, but each time, each time you shoot a rock, the rock splits off in random directions. Uh, so the, 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 the sub rocks do. So the key thing is now we've easily tuned the algorithm and it's now playing a much more skillful game. And this sort of tunability within uh, game AI to, to have these AI opponents that we can very easily tune the, the, the skill level in this, uh, in this way is, is very good. Uh, so that was, uh, that was Asteroids. So now we're going to see a very different game. Uh, so we'll run uh, Cave Swing. So this is a casual game that I keep meaning to publish. And so what we're gonna do is swing through the caves. So with a blue blue rectangle, a very simple avatar. And each time I hit the space bar, it's gonna attach a magic rope to the nearest anchor point, which is colored yellow. So it's a game that as a human player takes a little bit of skill to play, but I can do it because I've played before. And then the higher up the blue wall I finish, the better score I get. And also the faster I swing through, I get a better score. So if I play again. Set that one up a bit. And I hit the roof. You're not allowed to hit the roof. So that's a, clearly a very different game to Asteroids. And now I'm going to show the evolutionary algorithm playing it. And see how it was able to hit, hit the uh, blue wall right at the very top at the end. So it plays out very successfully. And we're now going to switch to a two player game and show it playing Planet Wars. And we get fantastic generalization. So I can change things like the number of planets. Uh, I don't have time to explain the full rules of Planet Wars. It's kind of space invasion game. Uh, if you want to play it for yourselves on your, your mobile phones, uh, search for Galcon, uh, which is a, a di different version, of a very similar game. And it's, uh, I think, great fun to play. Uh, so here we've got a yellow agent uh, playing against a, a blue agent. The yellow one is a, a SFP algorithm and the blue one is a handwritten heuristic controller. And they're sending ships to invade each other's planets. They're trying to take over the gray neutral planets. And the predicted scores are again shown on this, this graph here. Now, each, each time I run this, um, actually the the yellow player doesn't totally dominate the, the blue player. Uh, but the interesting thing is that this is the same album that a moment ago was playing Asteroid. So it's not the best Planet Wars player in the world, but it's one that we we just applied to this problem with uh, with virtually no effort at all. And on this occasion, it's, uh, it's well ahead now. So it's 300, 300 ships up and it's, it's certainly going to win. Yeah, so I think that's... Uh, something I find quite quite amazing actually that this AI works so well across such a range of games. And you can see actually on the predicted scores now, it's, it has actually won. So it's 
taken over all the blue planets. Okay, so back to the slideshow. Uh, we've also applied this to Pomerman, so this is interesting because it's a partially observable game. Uh, it was also run as a, a new RIPS competition, and we complete, uh, compared this with some deep RL methods uh, that had been entered in the competition, and we found that the, the SFP algorithms tend to be pretty competitive. Uh, so you can, um, we, we've open sourced all the code behind this, and you can just follow it from our Game AI website. Just another example of it working successfully. And then on this slide, we can see that um, we're comparing MCTS versus Roland Horizon Evolution. And here, actually, the performances are quite similar. I think probably MCTS is uh, sl slightly better than we are for this. But interestingly, uh, it gives us having these albums at our disposal gives us a range of different play behaviors. So what we find is that uh, Roland Horizon Evolution plants many more bombs. So these uh, heat maps the darker the color, the more bombs that are being placed at particular locations. And you can see that, uh, and that this is the observability. So that uh, you saw in the previous animated GIFs that uh, the agent has an observable window around it. And you can see that, um, that Rhea places many, many more bombs when it's got limited observability, which means that it tends to suicide because if it's still within the range of the bomb when it goes off, it gets killed. So it, it leads to similar play standards, but in, very different ways. Uh, I want to provide another example now of uh, SFP uh, in a word game. So this is, um, I guess, slightly, slightly inspired by Brian Shepard's work on Maven, uh, but this is a, a word game that I wrote uh, based on Lexicon Crisscross, which is an old classic game. And what we see here is um, uh, you've got to make words a bit like Scrabble, but uh, there's a deck of cards behind the scenes. Uh, the deck's got 75 cards in it, designed to be nice, five E's, one Z. Uh, we can choose when we play on the web to uh, have a particular shuffle of letters, but the AI playing it has no idea about the shuffle, but it does know the letter distribution. And then these are the kind of scoring things over here. Uh, so we can click this link now. And this is, um, so I, I can play this game as a, as a person and choose the where everything goes. Oh, come on, I'm thinking, come on, so make a word. <laughs> um, uh, that's a word, a very good one. And I've just got to, um, I can't actually make any, any good words at the moment. T, that's another one. Uh, so anyway, you get the idea. The, the aim is to make woods. Now I can choose a particular deck. I, I'm going to choose a particular deck here. And now every time I click on the, the uh, black area of the screen over here, it's going to... Uh, it's going to uh, use Monte Carlo search to decide the best policy. So what, what it's doing, and I, I hope to uh, demonstrate this in a better way, for each square where it can place each letter, so for example, a P, it does um, random random rollouts of the game, and it's just gonna pick the square that leads to the highest average score in this case. And uh, it does this very successfully. Well, quite, quite, quite successfully, I would say. And uh, you can play this, so if you follow that link, you can play it as a, play the game yourself and see how well you do uh, but these scores are, are pretty competitive and this is using the same pro approach of simulation based ai this time on a very different game obviously this uh, this word game uh, one of the interesting things behind this actually is that the predicted scores that it thinks is going to get uh, they're very very pessimistic and so at the start of the game for each square that it's uh, considering placing a letter, uh, it may be estimating that it's going to get, say, 30 or 40 points. Uh, in fact, it's going to probably get 100 points by the end of the game. So the actual values of the estimates are absolutely way off. But there's information in the rank order. And this is true across many of these sort of MCTS and uh, related methods. 
so we've also got a, a, a job to do tuning the parameters of the algorithm. Actually, these parameters uh, tend to be robust across um, uh, a wide range of games, but it, there is benefit in, in tuning them. And I don't have time to go through all of them, but uh, we've seen already, uh, for example, the, the uh, rollout length, that was a sequence length in asteroids. Uh, we can tune things like the discount factor, the opponent model, policy bias, if we, if we have it. There's a range of things that we can, we can tune here, whether or not to use a shift buffer. And so uh, we've developed some bandit-based methods for tuning these, and we have some papers on it. Uh, it's called NTB. And what we do is use combinatorial bandits uh, to tune the values of the parameters in combination with each other. And the basic idea is illustrated here. Uh, so the idea is that we want to balance exploration of values we haven't tried yet with exploitation of ones which already appear to be good. And so in these, in these pictures, the, num the red dots are the number of samples we made for each value of the parameter. This is the length parameter, the rollout length. And the blue bars are the, the exploration value. So ones we haven't tried yet have very high exploration factors. And then by the end of the run, these are the kind of samples we get. And we're going to choose the value in this case, L equals 50 with the, the highest mean. So when we do this, uh, we found something really interesting. And I, I recommend whatever you're doing, you know, uh, if you're using any, any type of um, AI, but more, more generally a whole range of agent based algorithms and other algorithms too, uh, they often have parameters to tune and you're probably much better off uh, or certainly at least trying one of the automated tuning methods. So we've got one called NTB. There's another one popular in the literature called SMAC and there are others, others as well. Uh, they're referenced in our papers. Uh, but one of the things that's really makes this so interesting is that often you find out things that you hadn't expected. Uh, so in evolutionary algorithms, if you've got a sequence length of 100, uh, th theory would tell you that your mutation strength should be set pro probably as one in 100. So you make on average uh, one mutation to the string each time. So you change one of the values. And we found the incredibly high values came out of the tuner. So 20%, so 20 times higher than you might typically expect. And th that was amazing. And then we understand now that what we're doing is not aiming for optimal, but just aiming for good. And uh, uh, this was very, very interesting. So definitely recommend using an auto tuner because you might learn some really interesting things and also just get better, better tuned algorithms. And then the things that we learn adapt to maps of any size typically. Uh, so some open challenges. Uh, the methods that I've uh, talked about, they work well already on a range of games. I, I really think they're underapplied, so we could be doing more of this sort of stuff for sure. Uh, but there are some challenges on, uh, you might, might find that it just, um, these methods struggle to work at all, and you've got to um, get in there as an engineer and, uh, and make them work so they don't just work out of the box. So one of them is handling combinatorial action spaces. So this is a great game uh, called Botbo by uh, the implementations by Niels uh, Justison. So the number of actions you can make at, at each, two, by the way, it's a simulation of American football and you control each of the players with a kind of possibly um, multi-step path at each time. And because of the combinatorial action space, uh, there might be 10 to the 50, 10 to the power of 50 actions available at any moment. And so the methods that we talk directly, uh, they, they don't uh, directly work on this. So having more general ones work, which work across these sort of challenges is very interesting. Uh, things like learning practical and useful opponent or collaborator models, uh, this, is, this is really challenging. Uh, doing more sample efficient learning, I think is also challenging. Learning world models, uh, I haven't referenced it here, but uh, one of the first uh, and really fantastic works on this was by uh, Ha and uh, Schmidt Huber on learning world models. Uh, but a real challenge actually is learning models of real world planet problems where there's no existing model, I think. And also hierarchical planning. Uh, so just uh, to reference some work that we've done recently on opponent modeling and exploring model quality, uh, this is work funded by DSTL and we've got a, a IEEE CC paper by Goodman and Lucas. Um, does it matter how well I know what you're thinking? 
so this is uh, working out how the quality of the opponent model and the assumptions you make uh, affect these SFP algorithms. And we applied this to a, a planning problem based on a, a, a wartime scenario. So we looked at uh, AI for war gaming and we applied this also in conjunction with, uh, with uh, human playthroughs of the game and uh, worked out how the AI could compete with, with humans at the same type of game and found some pretty interesting results there. Uh, and, and again, one of the impressive things is that these techniques, you can just apply them to problems like this, just out of the box. Uh, hierarchical planning, there's really interesting things to be done here. Uh, so, for example, you know, the, the classic thing, I want to go from London to Edinburgh. I don't plan every footstep. I think, am I going to go by plane or train and do, do planning at a very sort of high level first? So big challenges here and doing this automatically. Uh, so just uh, want to give a glimpse of some ongoing work within our group. Uh, part of this was inspired by a recent edge guide paper on sub goal based abstraction, a temporal abstraction in MCTS. And uh, what, what they did here was to define a sub goal predicate, which is easier than defining um, kind of macro actions. Uh, but the problem is that um, what they did for that paper was to hand design them. So in the grid world thing, I've got to get from the lower right to the so lower left to top right from X to the goal. So, so make X move to the goal. Uh, now we can improve the, the planning method if we put sub goals in. So you have a recognized um, kind of milestone on the way. And in that paper, they did them at the doorway. So this is illustrated here in this uh, implementation. However, uh, what this means is that if you decide that you're going to put sub goals in doorways, then you're limited uh, because you've got to make that kind of decision of, of where to put them. And for a different domain, that's going to be a different decision. So we're exploring, can you get by by creating random sub goals? And it turns out that you can. So here's a simulation of this. And without the random sub goals, obviously it's a very, very simple toy domain. Uh, but it normally fails to find a goal. However, if I restart it with random sub goals, so nothing special about these. Now these are just um, states a system could be in chosen at random. And hey, this time it finds a goal. So that's pretty good. Uh, so just to um, finish off then, uh, I think SFP is, is really an amazing concept and I, I don't think it gets uh, as much attention as it deserves really. It works really well across a wide range of games and other sorts of uh, planning problems. Uh, to scale up to real world applications are one of the next challenges, I think. Uh, for this, we do need a forward model, but it doesn't need to be perfect. And that, that's a really important point. And uh, the other thing is, I put here, real world applications are often messy and no need to be optimal. Uh, that's true for complex games as well. You know, they're really, really complex. Uh, very often you can only see part of the world. Uh, you have to make guesses about the stuff that you can't see. You have to make guesses about what the opponent's gonna do. And uh, it's a really sort of interesting area to be working in for sure. Uh, so uh, thanks for your attention and very happy to take any questions. Simon, many, many thanks. That was a fascinating talk um, in obviously a, a rapidly developing area. We did have a couple of questions on the um, on the chat. Um, and uh, if the speakers are still here, perhaps they'd like to um, unmute themselves and, and ask their questions. Um, so uh, Rakesh Mohan, Bart, you had a you had a question. Would you like to ask that? Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, we seem to have lost you, Rakesh. Well, I, I can read the question in the chat, so yeah, perhaps I'll just <laughs> go ahead and answer it anyway. So, so, go ahead, Simon. Uh, yeah, um, so, so Rakesh, your, your audio is coming through uh, very intermittent. So uh, the relationship between reinforcement learning and, and overfitting, I think, is is really complex. So it depends on so many things. It depends on the 
Uh, details of neural architecture, it depends on the features that are fed to the neural architecture. So the work I was showing from uh, the OpenAI uh, folks is, is a really good uh, way to look into this, I think. Uh, but if, if you're not careful with reinforcement learning, it can very easily overfit the environment that you're training it on. Uh, so two, two ways to counter this, I would say, is to uh, train it on a very wide range of environments. So again, if you look at those prop gen results, after it'd been trained on, say, 10,000 versions of the game, then it was learning to, to generalize quite well. Uh, or another thing you can do is to work in a feature space where the generalization is already baked into the features. Um, but that's often not the intention. Often we, we're looking for methods that are gonna be more general. And yet another thing you can do is try to learn the underlying model. So there's a lot of work going on in this area. So th thanks for the question. Thanks for that, Simon. There was another question from Alan Fish. Alan, would you like to uh, ask your question? Yes, thank you, Richard. Um, hi, Simon. I, I, I work in practical applications of AI, so it, it struck me uh, as being interesting that this idea that you might want to deliberately restrict the intelligence of your agents, where people normally want to make their agents as intelligent as possible. So I, I, I was just wondering if you could think of any any ways in which that might be a useful thing to do in the real world, um, maybe for explainability or predictability or, or I don't know. Uh, ab ab absolutely. So, for example, if you're if you're modeling people, uh, you might uh, let, let's say we had, uh, for example, a cybersecurity application uh, where you're trying to model users, then if all your users were sort of super clever, then they would be very hard to hack. Um, so, for example, if you're if you're sending email scam, uh, then if all those AIs that you're modeling receive the the kind of scam invitation via email, and uh, just say, "Well, I'm a clever AI, I'm not touching that," uh, then it's not going to well model the end users. But if, on the other hand, you've got a whole range, a whole kind of spectrum of it intelligence behind the AI, I guess intelligence. So, you know, I wouldn't want to use that. Maybe that's not quite the best way to say it. it it's about having a kind of a nuanced range of behaviors. So for example, in the Pomerman example, uh, we saw that the different agents actually behaved in different ways. And so it's not just very the overall intelligence. So, so yeah, so some people are su super clever and also a bit naive. And you want, you want a whole kind of population of users uh, to, to test these kind of real world applications on. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Is there uh, any other questions from, from the audience? If not, um, uh, perhaps I'd like to, to ask you one, Simon. Um, obviously, this is a, a rich area for um, moving across into real world applications. Um, where do you see the next step or where are the domains in the real world that you think this might uh, might be developing itself to step into uh, in the near future? I think the easiest one is anything that's already online. So any anything where you already have online systems and you perhaps already have uh, AI systems, um, things like uh, chatbots, uh, any, anything where there's a kind of set of transactions to be made and you want to model the effects of those transactions, you have uh, the need for uh, AI that can adapt rapidly to changing systems. So for example, you, you, you change a policy somewhere and you want to predict the effects of that policy change, uh, then it's, it's really sort of suitable for that sort of thing. And because you can give the the new model to the agents directly uh, and you don't have to spend any time at all training it you know you you can just start using it very directly um, then you can you can actually do automated um, mechanism design so you can experiment with new mechanisms have the agents play through the different scenarios and immediately you get feedback on doing this um, there's, a, there's a sort of different version of the talk where I, I don't do this for a real world application exact, 
exactly. But um, I do it for a game design. So the the version of Cave Swing that I showed you. In fact, mo most of the games we do, they they end up having a you know from a handful up to many many parameters in that very much control the behavior of the game and can make the game simple or very very difficult, very very complex. And um, the ability to change these things rapidly and say, well, okay, what 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 if I do this? How does it affect the the gameplay? Then that's enormously valuable. Oh, thank you. Uh, have we got time to answer the? There's one more question in the chat. Oh yes, if that's come true, yes, uh, go ahead. Well, Dean, do you uh, want to? Uh, you want to ask that? Explain your question. Uh, yeah, just to see if you know if we were doing it with um, some of the more traditional methods, we would be using TensorFlow or whatever to start experimenting. Is there a recommendation for something to start working with these algorithms? Um, I, I think there's, yeah, that, that, that's a really good point. I'm thinking, how did we, how do we miss that? So actually for NTB, uh, which is the hyperparameter optimization method, that's, uh, we've got a GitHub repository on, on that. So if you just search for NTB, uh, you should be able to find it. You can't just drop me an email and I'll send it to you. Uh, for the rolling horizon evolution stuff, I think a reasonable, I mean, the, the, the short answer is for a lot of these things, I can't think of, ah, okay. The, the, there are a couple of answers actually, I think. Um, so for the, for example, for the Rolling Horizon Evolution, there's a version of that in Pomerman and the Pomerman framework on my slide, that's completely open source. So that includes Monte Carlo Tree Search, it includes uh, Rolling Horizon Evolution, however, it's not in the nice sort of end, end user sort of state that some like TensorFlow or, or PyTorch is, I, I would say. But the, the, the code is there. The code is there, but it's not really in a user-friendly library. Uh, one of the other great resources is actually from DeepMind. There's um, something called OpenSpiel, which is a whole set of games uh, that it also includes uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search. Uh, I don't think it includes Rolling Horizon Evolution, but um, that's also... Definitely well worth a look. Can you repeat the name of that framework from Open DeepMind? Yes, yeah, uh, OpenSpiel. OpenSpiel. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Simon, thank you very much for a, for a, a fascinating talk. Thank you. I, I'm going to clap. If anybody else wants to uh, unmute themselves and clap, then we could do that. And we'll see if we can get up some proper, proper applause. So thank you very much. <laughs> learning how to use Zoom. Simon, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Annette. Thanks, bye-bye.